Okay, let's move to number two on the demonstration bond problems. This one says to calculate the yield of maturity for the American Water Capital bonds matured in 2037. Now those are down at the very bottom of the, uh, of the quotes that you have here, American Water Capital Corporation. It says coupon rate is 6.59%, yield 3.69%, and matures in 2037, and the ask price is 138.25. First of all, we just have to, in part two, calculate the yield of maturity. So let's remember, we're working with this basic formula here. We can start by inserting the value if these bonds are trading for 138.25, that's 138.25% of the $1,000 par value. So that is 1,300. 82.50, give myself a little bit more room here, not that that 50 cents is going to make a lot of difference there. Um, that's our, our uh, first value here, it's the price of the bond. Um, and the next would going, is going to be the coupon payment. Well remember, the uh, coupon interest is the principal and it's par value times coupon. And that coupon rate here is 6.59 percent, 0.0659. And of course, we're um, assuming, as most corporate bonds are, that they pay interest semi-annually. And so this is going to be basically an adjustment for the semi-annual um, interest payments. A thousand, that's $65.90, uh, divided by two. Let me grab my calculator here so I can calculate these just like you are. $65.90 divided by 2 is $32.95. So there is our semi-annual coupon payment. Plus, that's always $1,000, that future value there. Let's see, these bonds mature in 2037. It's 2020 right now, so that's 17 years from now, 34 semi-annual periods. 17 times 2 is 34. And uh, our required rate of return given in this problem, oh, that's what we're solving for, isn't it? <laughs> it's not the required rate. We're solving for the uh, internal rate of return or the yield of maturity and the first thing we have to do is to solve for I which is the semi-annual rate oops and clear out the calculator the very first thing 1382.5 make that a negative and that's my present value 32.95 is my payment that's a positive value 1000 is future value, that's also positive. See, we're paying this, as investors, we're paying this amount to get these, a negative, and these are positives. Or we could look at it from the uh, issuer's perspectives. Whoever is selling these bonds is going to be getting this amount, and they're going to have to give up these. You know, we can imagine that when the bonds are issued, the company is getting the issue price and making these promises. But, you know, even in one sense, even a subsequent seller of the bond, somebody who bought it maybe some years ago and has, hold, has been holding it, if they sell the bond today, they get this value, but also they are giving up this, uh, these future cash flows. So uh, it doesn't really matter where, whether this, uh, this sale or this purchase is actually from the company itself or it's from a, uh, in the secondary market, from the subsequent owner of the bonds. The, uh, uh, the process and the thought process and the mechanics are really the same anyway. So we've got the cash flows in there. Now 34 is N, and now we compute I. And the answer is I is 1.7847. That's a percent. But keep in mind, that's a semi-annual percent. So I want to annualize that, multiply that by 2, and the answer is 3.569%. For our purposes, we can round that off. I'm fine if you round that off to, let's say, 3.6%. Okay? This represents the yield to maturity. From a, the, the standpoint of an investor uh, in the bond, uh, using present value terminology, that also represents the internal rate of return. It also, by the way, 
reflects the market's required rate of return. In one sense, it represents the rate of return the market is imposing on those cash flows, the rate it is using to arrive at this uh, price for the bond. So we'll later on, you know, right now in this chapter and in chapter seven on stock, we're really looking at these securities from the standpoint of the, of the investor. You know, whether I'm asking you to look at this and to, for instance, that first problem, to determine whether this is a good investment by the present value and the IRR approaches. And so that really prevails throughout this chapter, but in a later chapter, we're gonna be more concerned about it from the issuer's perspective. And I'll say more about that later on. Okay, number three says, let's imagine that you leap forward in time, uh, five years to 2025. Now, I'm gonna get rid of this right here because I don't think we need that because this doesn't change, does it? That's one of those things. This won't change throughout the life of this bond. This won't change throughout the life of the bond. Now, this will change, but it changes very predictably. You know, after, in six months, that will be 33. Another six months, in would be uh, 32. In other words, as time passes, then the term to maturity gets shorter and shorter and shorter. Um, but other, otherwise, you know, this is the same, this is the same. We know how to figure this. But of course, the, uh, the way the market's looking at that bond, the required rate of return is going to change and that's gonna have an impact on, uh, on value. Maybe uh, pretty soon we can actually look at what's happened in bond markets just in recent days. You know that the financial markets have really been uh, turned topsy-turvy uh, with this coronavirus uh, matter. Uh, you, you, you have to be almost uh, comatose not to have uh, heard something about you know what's been happening. Well, the bond markets have been affected too, and we'll see that uh, as those yields change, as the mar the way the market is looking at this this bond, the risk that it perceives in holding that bond, as that goes up, then the discount rate used to value these goes up as well, and the present value goes down. Uh, there's an inverse relationship between the required rate of return. Okay, and the uh, value of the bonds. Well, let's look at number three then. So there's number two. Number three, we're going to continue with this same thing. So we're really using this same model. And just to make the point, I just think it's a healthy thing for you if you set up this model each time just to reinforce that you know this is a bond and this is the, the bond valuation model here. There's no real variations of this, and hopefully by the time you get to uh, the test and you'll be confident when you know it's a bond problem and it asks you to solve either for the yield to maturity or the uh, value that you can whip that out pretty, pretty quickly. So let's imagine you leap forward in time five years to 2025. If the yield of maturity at that time is 4.2%, in other words, we might say the bonds are selling to yield 4.2%, what would the price of the bonds be? What would the market price be at that time? So we're solving here for this. Okay, let's see what we know. This doesn't change. This amount doesn't change. N is no longer, of course, 34, because five, uh, five years have passed, okay? Five times two, 10 semi-annual periods have, have transpired. And so now instead of 34, N is 24. You can figure that out if you want to by, say, subtracting 2000, from 2037, 2025. 2037 minus 2025, 14, uh, excuse me, 12 periods, 12 years, 24 uh, semi-annual payments remain. And I is given in the problem here. If we're having to solve for the value, then we must have the required rate of return, and that's what the 4.2% uh, represents. 4.2% divided by two. Keep in mind, uh, we're dealing with semi-annual payments, semi-annual periods, and so this is a semi-annual rate here, 4.2 divided by two, okay? So let's see what the value of that bond would be given this information. I'm going to put that in 1,000 as the future value. You know, it doesn't matter in what order you input these values as long as you put them all in and correctly before you ask the calculator to, to uh, solve for that present value. 32.95, that's the payment. 24 is N. Uh, 4.2 divided by 2, I guess I could figure that in my head, 2.1% is I compute. 
present value. Okay, we get a value of $1,223.48. Okay, that's 1223 from our perspective. That's what it rounds to there. So the question is, at what price would the bonds be trading at that time? And the answer is $1,223. Now, it might ask you, well, let's just uh, let's review this anyway. You remember that bond values are quoted as a percentage of par. So what would be the quoted price for this bond? if it's selling for $1,223.48? And the answer to that is it would be 122.3. Okay, that would be the quoted price, 122.3% of the $1,000 par value. Okay, so that's the answer to number three. Number four, if in fact the bond's yield of maturity hasn't changed, uh, in fact, from the, uh, what was it here, 3.6% to 4.2%, and I'm not sure that's what I said in your notes. I'll have to correct that. If it has changed in this way, the yield of maturity has gone up from 3.6% to 4.2%. It says, refer to the three determ determinants of rates of return from an earlier chapter and explain what could have happened to produce that change in the yield of maturity. And the answer to that is, well, we've got three components of all rates of return. The, uh, the real risk-free rate, you know, we denoted that as I star. Let me see if I can put it right down here, hopefully. Well, I'm not sure you can still see that. Let me squeeze it in right there, okay? We've, we've described every rate of return, the rate of return on any investment is being really described or a function of or simply the sum of three basic components. The real risk-free rate, which is based on supply and demand for funds, a premium for inflation, and a premium for risk. And so if, in fact, the required rate of return on this bond has gone up, what could have caused that? Well, it could be that the, basically the demand curve for money has shifted to the right or the supply curve has shifted to the left. In other words, that there's an increased demand for money over that period of time or decreased supply that has caused this component of the rates of return, the, uh, the rate of return on this bond to go up. Another could be that the inflation outlook, uh, well, th there's a, a higher inflation rate expected for the future here uh, at this time in 2025 than there was in 2020, okay? In other words, the inflation premium has risen, could account for that. And the other one is the risk premium. That is the default risk, liquidity risk, maturity risk, well, it's not maturity risk of this bond as such because it's actually got a shorter term to maturity now than it had, but the default risk of that bond might have gone up, possibly liquidity risk. But in other words, somehow it could be that the risk of this bond has gone up, and that could help account for the increase from 3.6 to 4.2%. So you want to, you know, you don't want to flush uh, what you learned from an earlier chapter, in this case, chapter 10, uh, because those principles there help us understand the relationships that we observe, you know, in this valuation model, uh, for instance. So hopefully those would help you in uh, solving uh, those homework problems.